Next on Painting and Travel, Sarah explores the small mining town of Phillipsburg, Montana. While in a step-by-step -step process, Roger uses oil as he puts brush to canvas to complete a landscape from the historic town. Today, Sarah and I are in Phillipsburg, Montana. I'd like to do a painting of this church and the road, but there's some traffic along here, so I won't be able to set up and do that. So we'll take some photographs, go back to the studio and paint there. One thing we like to do when we travel is to turn off from the main road onto a smaller winding road because we've seen a distant vista that we want to get closer to and because we just feel like slowing down for a while to get away from the four lane hustle and bustle. This is exactly how we've happened to find the historic mining town of Phillipsburg, Montana, where we spent a couple of days in picturesque surroundings. The population here now is around 850, with most of the families having been here for several generations. The downtown is very pretty, and a lot of restoration has taken place. The painted storefronts are cheery, with interesting architecture. It's fun to sit on a nice bench on the main street and just relax for a while and enjoy a perfect day eating candy from an old-fashioned sweet store that has lots of choices. Mick waited while I looked around at the hard candies, chewy caramels, candies from times past, and chocolates. Unfortunately, I miss the dog treats, and you can't give a dog chocolate, even if they beg. In the 1890s, stores on this street would have included emporiums, banks, a mercantile, hotels, saloons, a general store, a laundry, and an assayer's office for weighing silver and other precious metals and stones. The Granite County Jail is listed in the National Register of Historic Places and remains one of Montana's oldest jails, still serving its original function. The Opera House is the oldest operating theater in the state, offering great shows all summer. The Granite County Museum has recreated a creaky old mine shaft that's dark, lit only by lamplight therefore giving you the feeling of how difficult it must have been to do the dangerous and physically demanding job in a dimly lit space. Those miners were a rugged bunch, not scared of anything. Later we walked up a gravel road and saw a teepee, an orange shed, and a highly decorated sapphire blue cabin. These bright colors must look great during winter months too. We like this small town, and I'm glad we didn't miss it by sticking strictly to our route. Montana is full of these little gems, and I never get tired of exploring. I spotted this scene in Phillipsburg just out of the corner of my eye as we drove by in our RV. I turned around, and I thought this would make a nice painting. I like just about everything about it, the composition, the way this road goes up the hill, the church, the buildings. So I'm going to get started. I'm using oil paints on a linen canvas, and I've toned this board with a bit of burnt sienna. I think I'll start, as usual, by mixing some of my dark colors. Here is ultramarine blue and burnt umber. We'll just get a few of these areas of the real darks in here. I'll pick up a bit of green. This is chromium oxide green. And one reason I'm starting with the darks, I know there's going to be a lighter sky back here, but it's easier to put light colors over dark colors than it is to put dark colors over light colors. So I'm going to start with these darks. I'll get some dark trees in here. I'll vary these colors as I go. I'll just keep picking up some different tones here, some oranges and reds, just to vary these greens. And all these can be refined as I move along in the painting. 
I think I'll just stay with these greens here. I think the greens are the darkest part of this painting. And I'm not mixing any white with these paints right now. Now this chromium oxide green does have white in it. It is an opaque color. The rest of these colors that I've been picking up here are pretty transparent. So uh, that's why they remain so dark. If I were to use some of these other colors like, like cadmium yellow light, that's an opaque color and that would definitely make these greens much lighter as you can see. But I'll stay with the dark colors for right now. I have my reference photo right over here on my computer monitor. And when I was there, I took other details of this church and the surrounding buildings and the road. So I'll have good reference. One thing to remember when painting from a photograph, the photograph will not give you the lights and darks like you can see in real life. Now this particular photograph here is exposed pretty well, but as you can see, the sky is all washed out. In real life, that was much more brilliant, but the camera just can't pick up everything. That's why I often want to paint outside because I can pick up so much more information, so much more detail, and learn so much more by working outside. It does get more difficult, but the learning experience is much better. Put some of this burnt sienna here in this green. Got a very dark shadow coming down here in the bottom. I'm going to jump around on this piece. I'm not going to try and work on any one area. Just basically the darks first. That's Indian yellow. That's a transparent color there. Not all Indian yellows are transparent, but this one is. I like the transparent Indian yellow. I use it quite a bit. I sketched this piece in pencil before I started, so I have a good roadmap as to where I need to place all these things. Right over here on the right side, we have some lighter colors that are very warm. So I'll pick up my burnt sienna and yellow ochre. Now I'm starting to get into the more opaque colors, which means that they'll uh, be lighter in value. And value, all value means is the difference between lightness and darkness. This is a dark value, this is a, a lighter value. So when I say values, it just means light, lightness or darkness. Well, I think that pretty much takes care of the really dark areas. Now we'll move up one step, a little bit lighter. We'll take some white in here and move to the middle tone values. Got a very gray looking field here, but it's very warm. So I'm taking my yellow ochres, my glycerin crimsons, some white, and I'm keeping this slightly darker than I think it needs to be because it's easier to, to lighten things up than it is to get things darker once this paint is on the canvas. Now, even though I said that I'm keeping this slightly darker than I probably want it to be in the final painting, I'm trying to get my values as close as I can to what I think they should ultimately be. I don't want to stray too far from those, but it's very hard to know what values are going to be correct until the whole canvas gets covered because painting is always a relationship between each color. Like right now, the lightest thing on this painting is this burnt sienna tone here, but that's in context with the rest of it. If I were to put some white on there right now, this, would, this burnt sienna tone would appear as a middle tone. Right now, it's the lightest thing on the painting in context with the rest of the colors. So as I keep adding more values and keep filling up the painting, the relationship changes. It changes all the time. I'm going to make these greens in the foreground a little more intense than the colors in the background. Anything in the foreground will have more color in it than in the background. In the foreground, if it's the same kind of grass, it's going to be more vivid, have more color on it, be more intense here in the foreground than it is in the background. Because as it goes in the background, it has a little more atmosphere between you in the background and uh, the intensity gets lost. Now having put this burnt sienna on here is very helpful because some of this burnt sienna can glow through the painting and it can remain as part of the painting. Most of it's going to get covered up, but a little bit of it can glow through here and there. And the burnt sienna choice is a, a good choice, especially for landscape paintings like this. Now I'll pick up some of the green again here. As I said, this is a slightly more intense color 
down here. And I'm blending these colors in here as I go, but I don't want to blend them a, a lot. I want to, my brush strokes to show because brushwork is kind of what makes a painting interesting. I'm using the side of my brush quite a bit here. Just dragging this paint around. I'm not being very fussy at all. In other words, I'm not working on a lot of detail right now. I'm blocking in the large areas, which is so very important to the first part of a painting. I guess it's really a matter of choice as to what I work on next. So, uh, down in this area, so I'll work on the road. And as I look at that road, I see some warm colors where the sun is hitting it more and cooler colors where there's some shadows. I like the irregular shape of the road and the way some of the ruts come down there. It just makes a beautiful composition. I think I'll start with the, the uh, cooler colors. Cerulean blue, and I'll warm that with burnt sienna. And right up here, this is where I see that darker area. Also down here, this appears to be much darker. This is where that shadow comes across the road. I have to be careful on these shadows not to get them too blue. Otherwise, they'll start to look like water. Okay, I'm gonna leave this part of it as it is for now and start moving up into this area. The side of the house here on the upper right is in, in shadow and it's very blue. I think it might, might be a blue house anyway to begin with, with some blue siding on there. Now that looks too blue, so I'm going to put some burnt umber in it, gray that slightly. And right up under the eaves here, it'll be darker. Jump over here, we have a tin roof. I love to paint tin roofs. They always have that nice warm color on them. I'm going to stay with this large brush for right now. And there's another house back here that's kind of a warm color. Now the roof of the church here is kind of a blue-green and some dark colors back here. Sun is coming from this way, so this steeple is casting a shadow back here. Here's some of the distant trees that are catching a lot of sunlight. Now in the photograph, the sky is almost as light as the side of the church and the steeple here. But I'm going to make the sky darker because I really want some nice accents and highlights on the side of this church and the steeple. So I'll, when I put in the sky here, I'll make that darker and I'll reserve the very bright highlights right here for the side of the steeple. Mixing up kind of a gray color, grayish blue color. I'll just cut around the church. And I'm going to vary the blues here in the sky quite a bit. Here's some orange mixed in with this. So we'll make this a warmer color down here. Now as I paint the sky color, I'm not going too very close to the trees because I don't want that green to mix in with the trees. So I'm leaving space here and then I can blend those later. Now it's going to be much easier for me to take this dark color and drag it out over this light color than it will be to bring the light color in over the dark colors. Because if I bring these light colors in over the dark colors like that, looks good, but my very next stroke is going to have some of that dark paint on it. And I'd have to wipe my brush off every single time. So I'm leaving a little bit of space around here for right now. Well, that's getting the sky just about covered. So that's a good step. With some burnt sienna and cerulean blue, I'll make this dark color. This is a brick house here. And this part of it's in shadow, so this is going to be quite dark. And of course, even darker up here under the eaves. I'm switching to a smaller brush here to add some of the smaller areas of the roofs. I use as large a brush as I can on most of the painting. I don't want to burden myself with any more detail than I have to, especially at the start of the painting. This brick house right here in the distance is catching a lot of sunlight. A lot of these areas are just very gray and neutral in color. And the difference between a lot of these colors is not in the value, it's just in the warmness or darkness of the color. Now this is a very warm color here, and this is a cool color, but it's the same value. So if I were to turn these to black and white, you can see that there's really no difference. 
Now when we put it back to color, you can see this one's warm and this one's cool, but they're both the same value, the same lightness or darkness. Sometimes that's the only way to figure out what color something is, because there's really so little color in some of these things. The only, way, only thing to say is, is it a warm color or a cool color? It's basically gray, but it's maybe a cool or a warm gray color. One thing that caught my eye about this is the way the light is hitting the side of the church steeple. Just makes a nice highlight. Right up here on the front of the church, this is going to be my lightest area of the painting. But I'm not making it pure white. I'm taking my titanium white and I'm adding some yellow ochre to it just to warm that up because this is being lit by the sun and anything lit by the sun like that is going to have a warm warm side to it. Now maybe later I might go over this with some pure white just for some few accents, but right now I want to keep this a little bit below pure white. Right here this part is in shadow so we'll make this sort of a cool tone and slightly darker than the front. And right under the eave here that will be also cool and dark. Now even this area with the steeple, I don't need to use a very small brush to start with. I'll, use, I'll still try and use as large a brush as I can, and then later on I'll use a smaller and smaller brush to add some small details. Now this looks to be a copper roof on the church, which uh, always turns green with age, and sometimes a warm color, so I'll mix some burnt sienna with that. This will be the dark side here. I'll add some white to that, and this will be the highlight side. This is a very important part of the painting, so I will go back with a smaller brush and work on that some more. All the color on these structures in the back here tend to get very gray because they are in the distance and the color seems to fade out and blend in with the atmosphere. So none of these colors back here will be very brilliant. Sunlight hitting this roof here. This is a mansard roof. And the front of this house here is very bright. There are some distant trees back here on a mountain that's quite some ways away. So that's primarily going to be blue because there's a lot of atmosphere between me and where these distant trees are. I'll add this chimney and then drag that color down this way to create a shadow. Just using my cool gray colors I'm adding these windows, warm shadow right under the eave. Now I'll move over and work on this house here, the brick house. Here the light is catching it on the front side. And the porch right here is very dark in the inner portions of it. I'll lay those dark colors in just with burnt umber and some blue. Makes a nice neutral tone. And this area tends to get lost in the darkness of these trees which is good because I want these, some of these areas to blend together. I don't want there to be big definitions like this is a tree here, this is a house here. They, all these things intertwine, so they sort of lose themselves in one another in parts of the painting, just a lost and found. You see it and then you don't see it. You sort of lose it in amongst the green. Here's a window on the second floor. And here we have a curved window on the front. It's a beautiful window. I'll move back over to the right here. Place a few windows in on this house. Well, this is a good part of the painting now because I have everything covered. Now I can go in and start refining my colors, my values, and begin to add details. I took a number of photographs while I was here. So I'm using one of those now to show me more details of this road. I'm keeping this painting loose. There's no real need for a lot of detail or attention to little brush strokes in areas like this. At least not, that's not the way I proceed with these paintings. I don't want a lot of detail in every single area. I just want detail in the areas that have the center of interest where I want the eye to focus. And with a light touch of my brush, just scumble these colors down this path 
to indicate some rocks and pebbles. Rough brushwork should do it on this, with maybe a few small minor details towards the end of the painting. Right now, this rough brushwork will do just fine. On this side of the road, we have some sunlight hitting the edge of the bank. Well, I think I'll jump up to these trees here in the upper right-hand corner and with some dark colors, mainly ultramarine blue and burnt umber, maybe a touch of green here. We'll bring these branches out into the area of the sky. Just using a very light touch of my brush here, kind of using the edge of the brush, just kind of tapping it on there, bringing those branches out into the area of the sky. Well, that looks okay, but now I need to put some negative areas in here. So I'll once again mix up some color that matches the sky, and I'll touch in these sky colors with these negative areas, which will show some of the branches and limbs. And right in the center here, I'll make a few larger negative areas and leave this space right in between, and that will indicate the trunk of the tree. So I'm sort of cutting around the trunk of the tree with these negative areas or sky holes. And now on the left side, I'll begin to refine some of the areas here where the center of interest lies. I'll put some rusty orange looking colors on this tin roof, actually galvanized roof. You can always count on a, a roof like this to add some character to a painting. And I'll dip into my greens again my dark colors. We'll take this tree, flip it up over the buildings in the back. Well, it's time to get out a small brush now to add some of the smaller details. And we'll start up here with the roof of the church. Just going to lay my ruler on here. And with my fingers on the ruler, use this as a guide to drag some straight lines down here. Here's the bell right inside the steeple. Now here's where I'm going to take a bit of pure white and put this on very thick and just add that as a nice highlight. This paint will be very thick on there. And also right here at the top. Now here's where we have a lot going on. This porch right here. We have the window in the front. And these dark areas here will indicate where there's some Victorian uh, decorative woodwork, and yeah, just with a very light touch of my brush, add some of these details down here. Well, there's nothing magic about adding detail to a painting. It just takes a little bit of time and effort. And just because I have detail in one part of a painting, doesn't mean I need detail over the whole painting. I primarily want my detail where the center of interest lies, which is up in this area. Down here where there's grasses, I don't want as much detail. I just want a suggestion of them. Now, there's lots of different methods and ways to put in detail. And if you wanted detail down here in the grasses, nothing from keeping you from doing that. But I just prefer to have some things suggested and other things in more sharp focus. It really all depends on your style of painting. Now, the background to this painting is still wet. The sky is still wet. Now, the tree seems to have tacked up some, but I'm going to take this tree now and drag it out into the sky. I can let some of that burnt sienna underpainting show through right in these areas. That's okay. Gives a nice warmth. But most of it's going to disappear back in there. And with some of my sky color again, which was primarily the cerulean blue and white and some orange, and I'll drop some negative areas in this tree here, some sky holes. I want to try and vary those shapes. I don't want them all the same size. So I'll have some larger, some smaller, some longer, and some shorter. It's also a good way to define the edge of the roof back here. I can put in sky holes right back here. And that will kind of define the edge of this roof continuing on. Right up in here where these houses are, we have another telephone pole. And I often like things like telephone poles in a painting. It just gives it a real air of reality. So I don't want to leave that out. I want to just add some of these things. I had another telephone pole over here. There is another light pole right in front of the church, but I am not going to put that in. That would really distract from the composition here. I'm going to put in some wires, though, so with a loaded brush, with thin paint, 
I only have one chance at this, <laughs> so I'm going to sort of give myself a few test passes here and then just hit it and hope I get it. When I went across here with this wire, I went a little high. So instead of redoing the sky or reblending that sky, I just put another arm here on the uh, telephone pole. There's a pine tree right here and it's kind of gotten lost in amongst these others. So I'll take a cool color and accentuate that. I'll put a few small shadows up here on this roof. This is a very light color here and I'm just using a very light touch. And since there's some good texture under this painting, as I put this light touch on, you can see that it uh, gives me a sense of looking at some weeds here in this field. As this road comes down the hill, crosses this road that's parallel and comes over onto this side. So I'll add some ruts here, some tire tracks here in the foreground. Now this whole area down here on the bottom is in shadow, but I'm going to take some of my color from the road and just scumble a few areas that might look like some pebbles and rocks. Well, this was a pleasure working on this landscape painting and I could add more detail, but we're out of time. This was a fascinating town. Sarah and I very much enjoyed our visit there to Phillipsburg, Montana. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.